I want to introduce our speaker today, who's fabulous. I heard her speak yesterday, and we're really excited to have her. And this is Mary Lou Smith, PhD. She's a clinical neuropsychologist at Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, Canada, which I believe is the major center performing hemispherectomies in Canada. Is that correct? And over the past several years, her major areas of research have been on the cognitive and behavioral comorbidities associated with epilepsy. Her studies have involved individuals with intractable seizures with onset in childhood and have addressed four major areas, quality of life, surgical outcome, plasticity of language representation, and memory. She is one of the few neuroscientists who are longitudinally following children with epilepsy treated with surgery or medication, children with high fun functioning autism, and children born preterm. Many of these studies involve examining the cognitive, academic, social, emotional, and behavioral effects of these disorders and the evaluation of their structural and functional neuroimaging correlates. She has particular interest in the long-term effects of surgery on children and its outcomes in young adulthood. So you can see why she's here. So obviously, we're going to have a great time. And welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think we're waiting for a portable mic. I'm sorry. That's okay. It's just that um, it's hard for me to point at the screen from okay. back here. But anyway, thank you for that lovely introduction. And I am um, delighted to be here. My passion is working with children with intractable epilepsy and children who have undergone a surgery. So to be at a forum like this is very, very exciting for me. I have tried to allow to leave time, uh, at lots of time at the end for discussion and questions. But if you have any questions as I'm going along, feel free to put up your hand. Yes. Okay, there. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so please uh, feel free to uh, interrupt. If it's a point that I'm going to come to, I might just ask you to hold it uh, for a moment, but uh, otherwise we can discuss it on the spot. Okay, so uh, many of you will have had neuropsychological assessments or have had children who have had neuropsychological assessments, or maybe you're contemplating whether or not you want your child to have one. And so I just want to, I was asked to give an overview today of what an assessment is, what kind of procedures we use, the rationale behind it, and what kind of information might be extracted from such an assessment. So these are the topics that I hope to cover in this session. I wanna just briefly say what is neuropsychology? What is a neuropsychologist? How do you know what, when you've met a real one? What are the goals of neuropsychological assessment? And what exactly is that assessment and, and how do we translate it into action? Now, I think for children, the best translation into action is in developing the best educational plan for your child. And I know that there are sessions at the meeting today or tomorrow or both on working with the school to develop the IEP and taking the neuropsychological assessment results and trying to translate them into something meaningful and helpful for the child. So what is neuropsychology? Well, you know, we are the branch of psychology that is interested in the relationship between brain function and how that plays itself out into different aspects of behavior. And I'm using behavior in the broadest way. And please note that I can spell. That's just the Canadian spelling of behavior. It's not a mistake. <laughs> um, so some of the kinds of behaviors that, well, well the, the brain controls everything. We know that. It controls uh, motor skills, uh, thinking. Uh, memory, emotion, social behaviors, and that's what the psychologist, neuropsychologist is interested in. Well, what are the links between normal brain development and those kind, that broad spectrum of behaviors, and what happens when normal brain development goes awry? So what is a pediatric neuropsychologist? So we are a specialty branch. We are trained to the doctoral level, so we'd have PhD, and in many places 
in order to be registered or licensed as a pediatric neuropsychologist, you also have to do additional training, specialized training after the PhD. And that training provides us with a knowledge base in the development of the brain, in the development of cognition. We know about how the brain is organized for different functions and how different parts of the brain uh, act and interact with each other. We learn about the effects of different types of brain injuries, whether they be congenital, so the present from the time of birth or the, uh, the, from the beginning when the brain begins to develop, such as in cortical dysplasias. And we are also well-versed in typical and atypical cognitive and behavioral development. So it's very important for us to have an understanding of what is typical and so that we can then gauge what is atypical. And when we know about patterns of atypical brain development, we can make predictions about different kinds of outcomes. So if you are seeking a neuropsychological assessment for your child, it's very important that, in fact, the neuropsychologists have training in pediatrics. I've seen some adult neuropsychologists who just treat children as short adults, and that is not the best approach because the developing brain is very, very different from the mature brain. So if you seek out an assessment, make sure it's with someone who has the uh, foundation in development. So the typical neuropsychological assessment can have one or more goals. And on this slide and a few following slides, I've outlined what I think these major goals are. They may differ from child to child, and they may differ from age to age. So one of the primary goals is to try to establish the developmental level of the child in order to determine what are the best interventions or treatments. So we, with our assessment, we try to pinpoint those areas in which the child is weak or is lagging and, and uh, the child needs some kind of support to foster best development. And then we use that information to try to develop targeted treatment plans for these delayed skills. Another thing uh, that a neuropsychological assessment can be used for is to monitor changes in cognitive development that are related to disease factors or to treatment factors. So sometimes the progression of the disease may have changes in cognition or changes in behavior as a primary symptom of the progression of the disease. And that may trigger to your neurologists or neurosurgeons that something is going on here that needs um, attention. Maybe you need to go back for a different diagnostic consideration, or maybe you need to change uh, treatment. A third goal is to monitor what we call iatrogenic changes, or this uh, really is like side effects, negative side effects. Um, of different kinds of treatments. So surgery or anti-seizure drugs may be associated with adverse effects on cognition and behavior. And the neuropsychological assessment, particularly if we have the advantage of doing serial neuropsychological assessments, can be helpful in looking at changes and saying, oh, here's something that's changed, here's something that seems to be declining, or gosh, this child just started on topiramate, and now her verbal memory is quite poor. That's a known side effect of topiramate. Do you want to go back to your neurologist and have a discussion about whether or not there's a different drug that can be used? Another goal, uh, another referral question that we sometimes get is, what is the interaction between cognitive and psychosocial issues. So I recently was contacted by parents of a 13-year-old girl who had had a removal resection from her right temporal lobe when she was five years of age. She had a tumor um, and epilepsy, and uh, the, the surgery was very successful. She did not have any seizures after the surgery, and she had been off her medications for several years. And their question was, 
her social behavior is atrocious. She doesn't know how to get along with people. Um, she, re she has no impulse control. She reacts aggressively when she gets frustrated. And their question was whether or not this, what they uh, saw as this immaturity in social behavior was accompanied by an immaturity of her cognitive skills that could help explain it. It turned out in the assessment that most of her cognitive skills were bang on where they should be for her age, with the exception of her executive function skills, those skills that are um, important for self-insight, for behavioral regulation, for monitoring, for impulse control. So we were able to make some suggestions to them about some remediation in those areas that could potentially help her with some of these inappropriate social interactions. And finally, and I've alluded to this already, we use the uh, results that we get from the testing. We, we look and see what, what, is the child's, what are the child's strengths and what are the child's weaknesses. And it's always important that we look for strengths as well as weaknesses. And then we can use those to make recommendations for targeted interventions. And we, it's important that we know about the strengths because we try to use those to help scaffold or compensate for the areas of weakness. Now, um, in children with epilepsy, there might be also some specialized goals of the neuropsychological assessment. So we can provide information about potential risks or benefits of surgical treatment. So at SickKids, we have a weekly what we call seizure conference, where we sit down and we review all of the information um, that's been gathered for the, from all the complexity of medical um, tests. And one of the questions that's always addressed is, well, if this child goes to surgery, what are some of the potential outcomes? Like, oh, if you remove the hippocampus, this child is going to have a memory problem. Or, you know what, I think in this child, it's OK to remove the hippocampus because the memory is already compromised. Or, gosh, we better do more mapping of language because this child could be at risk for losing language if language is in that area you're planning to do surgery in, and so on. Uh, with uh, the surgical candidates, we also assess those cognitive and behavioral um, changes. So it's really helpful to have a pre-surgical baseline against which um, to uh, evaluate further development and further change over time. And in older children, in teenagers, often the information that we gather can contribute to the localization of seizure onset through the evaluation of function because we know how functions are organized in the brain, what areas of the brain might be compromised, and so on. And all of this, we hope, will provide useful information to optimize the child's function at the time of the evaluation um, or after the treatment. Now, what are the reasons why you might want to have a neuropsychological assessment that's really unrelated to epilepsy or surgery per se? Because it's not only kids with epilepsy and not only kids with hemorrhoidectomies who have um, neuropsychological assessments. But parents, teachers, clinicians often request a neuropsychological assessment because they want information about the child's cognitive uh, status, about the child's behavioral status, about the child's emotional status, in order to understand the child's current problems, to develop a plan for treatment, to establish whether or not the child meets certain neurodevelopmental uh, criteria for certain neurodevelopmental disorders, and that may mean that they are eligible for certain kinds of services. And also, the assessment can be helpful in assessing treatment effectiveness. So we've put this child on this medication, stimulant medication, because they have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Has that improved their working memory? Has that, in fact, improved their ability to sustain their attention or whatever? Now, here's some of the examples of the kinds of questions that um, parents bring to us or that other uh, specialists uh, bring to us when they refer a child for an assessment. What is this child's current level of function? 
We have a 10-year-old child. Is she functioning at the level of a 10-year-old, or is she functioning at the level of a 2-year-old, or somewhere in between? Does the child meet criteria for diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, intellectual disability, a specific learning disability, or any number of other disorders that there might be? Has the child's cognitive function changed over time? That change could be in relation to a specific treatment, as I've mentioned, or we know that children develop. You um, heard Dr. Kolb speak about changes in brain with increasing age, with changes in the brain, with the influx of hormones that happen in puberty, and all of these things can change the child's cognitive, um, the pattern of cognitive or behavioral functioning as well. What are the reasonable expectations for a child in terms of their adaptive function, in terms of their adaptive, uh, sorry, their academic achievement, in terms of their ability to live independently, uh, eventually undertake employment, and so on? Some of these questions may resonate with you. What are the supports and services that the child requires? And what service does the child qualify for given their diagnosis? Now, I know that sometimes parents don't like diagnoses. They don't like the fact that their child may be labeled with ADHD or autism spectrum disorder or intellectual disability or whatever. And I understand that, and I go through with them that the diagnosis may change over time with development, that it should be renewed regularly. It's not a tattoo or a brand that's lifelong. And the important thing about it is that it buys you an in for specific services for your child. That's the important thing. It gets you things that the child may not otherwise be eligible for. OK, so let's turn to some of the general principles of assessment. And usually what we want to do in an ideal assessment is to include both qualitative and quantitative um, aspects of function. And in particularly, we want to take a good history to know whether or not these have changed over time. So we will do this based on our tests, based on the history of the child's developmental milestones. We seek information from parents. We seek information from teachers. And we do a lot of observations of the child in the assessment environment. We want to try to understand whether there are psychosocial and environmental influences. So does the child, is the child able to pay attention while sitting in the psychologist's office, which is quiet and there's no distractions, but put them in the classroom with 25 other children and all hell breaks loose? So those are the kinds of environmental influences that can impact on a child. And it's important for us, um, particularly with uh, population like children who undergo large cortical resections, to uh, um, undertake an evaluation of the medical history in considering the child's uh, development. So let's turn to what is a neuropsychological assessment. Well, if you look at this picture on the left, um, it was taken in 1905. And at that time, there was um, a craze called phrenology. And basically, phrenology was based on the idea that everybody's skull has a different shape, and you could measure the bumps on the skull, and um, those would be correlated with your um, functions. And people deri derived maps of the brain based on these phrenology bumps. And you know, a bump here meant that you were very emotional, and a bump over here meant you were very insightful, um, and so on. And um, Fortunately, we've moved a little beyond that. And in fact, I love this picture as courtesy of the Museum of Questionable Medical Devices. So, <laughs> um, so we use different methods. We don't measure the bumps on the heads. We try to study the brain by um, evaluating its cognitive and behavioral byproducts or outputs. And we typically do this by using what we call standardized tests, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those in a moment. 
And we try to document the abilities and the deficits that the child is showing. So I like to think of it as the, quali uh, the quantitative neurological exam. So you know when you bring your child in to see the neurologist and they test the cranial nerves and reflexes and grip strength. And we try to do the same kind of things to more complex functions and to, put the, and to quantify them. So what's very important uh, about any kind of psychological assessment, whether it's neuropsychological assessment or otherwise, is that we use fixed procedures for administration, for timing, and for scoring. So that every child who takes that test takes it in exactly the same way. So if you get a different score than you do, the only reason for that is that you differ in the ability that we're trying to measure. You don't differ because I gave you an extra five minutes or I explained the instructions in until you got it. So that's what we mean by a standardized assessment. Now, I will acknowledge that there are times when the standardized assessment approach does not work with children. It does not work with children who may be very, very young or maybe have a, a lot of impairments that interfere with this standardized um, assessment. And yes? So the standardized testing is for an individual that uses both halves of their brain. My son just had testing. Yes. And it was a little surprising, but I was told because they don't have testing for people that use <laughs> So, so how does that affect yeah, I'll, I'll get to, can I come back to that question? I'll get to it. Um, so the tests are, are developed and are standardized on typically developing um, individuals. Um, and we assume they have both halves of their brain. But the question that you would have for your son is, because my son has one hemisphere that's been surgically resected, how has that affected his performance? And the way that we do that is that we look at his performance in comparison to how other children do so that we know where he's functioning um, and what his strengths and weaknesses are. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. And if you just still don't understand it, stop me. Okay? So when, we, when I say we test the limits, it might be that, um, what, like for example, one of the very common findings that we see with children with epilepsy is that they have slow processing speed. We know that any kind of insult to the brain can slow down your ability to take in information and to formulate information for uh, output. And that may be further compromised by the anti-seizure drugs that children are on, because many of these also slow down processing speed. So if we have a time test and the child doesn't do well on it, we might see, well, let's see what happens if, in fact, we now redo the test, but we give the child long, as much time as needed. Can the child do the task or not? And that's valuable information that we can then say, this child's abilities in area X are compromised under timed conditions, but with extra time, the child is able to accomplish the task and that's important to know. The uh, standardized, uh, t standardized tests come with um, interpretive guidelines, and they come with norms, because they've all been tried out on children of all different ages, so we know what a typically developing three-year-old would do on this test, and what a typically developing six-year-old would do on this test, and we can use that as sort of a baseline for comparison. So here are some of the characteristics of uh, psychological tests. We consider them to be a sample of behavior. So really, we're trying to um, understand the child within a relatively short period of time. And so we're going to sample behavior in a specific way uh, within that period of time. They require the child to do something. They are not meant to be exhaustive measures. Right? They're just samples of behavior. We can't know everything about what your child would be like in every single situation, because we'd be with you forever. But a good psychological test tries to obtain a representative sample of the measured behavior. And ideally, 
there should be a clear connection between the test and the measured behavior in a real world setting. So if I'm reviewing a psychological test and I say to myself, I don't get it. I don't know what this test is trying to measure. And I've read the manual and it sounds kind of like psychobabble to me. And I can't even think about how, what would be comparable to this behavior in the child's everyday world that I don't use that test. I don't get it. I don't use it. So the tests that we use correspond to some expected behaviors for age. And obviously those behaviors differ by age. You don't expect the same behavior of a two-year-old as you expect of an 18-year-old. So for example, if we're evaluating a, an infant, say a six-month-old, we would be looking to see, does the child reach for an object of interest? So we'd have like, you know, nice brightly colored toys that we'd hold outside the child's reach and see if they can orient to it and reach to it. Do they res does the child respond to his or her image in a mirror? Does the child, if you give the child um, two objects, will they bang them together and play? So these are developmentally appropriate kinds of behaviors for children. And this is what we're looking to see whether or not the child can do this. And we would do this through direct testing, giving the children these objects. And for the assessment of a, a young infant, the parent would always be present in the room. And we would be saying, "Does your OK, your child just didn't reach for the object. But do you see that at home? Because maybe this is not the child's best moment. And infants are notorious for falling asleep during their assessments. And that, Never get them. You probably wish they'd sleep more at home, but maybe, and we wish they'd sleep less in our assessments. Um, for a 10-year-old, we would be using entirely different kinds of tasks. We might ask a question like, how are a snake and an alligator alike? Because we're trying to uh, understand the child's ability to do conceptual reasoning. Does the child recognize that these both fall into the same categories? They're both animals, and even more sophisticated, they're both reptiles. What is the capital of France? So what's the child's fund of knowledge like? Or we might ask them to solve this puzzle that you see there, where you see three rows of boxes and then a line. And the child is asked which of those three boxes under the line best fits the pattern, which one should go here. I won't embarrass anyone and put you on the spot and ask you what the right answer is. And there are many, many items on each scale, right? So it's not enough to just ask, what's the capital of France? And based on that, say this child's fund of general knowledge is good or not good. So let me talk a little bit about the difference between the neuropsychological assessment and other types of evaluation that your children may have had or you may have heard about. And the three probably most common ones are the developmental evaluation, the psychoeducational assessment, and the neuropsychological assessment. So the developmental assessment is what's typically done in infants and toddlers. And we are asking, is this child meeting his or her developmental milestones? And if not, where is the child lagging and in, in what particular types of behaviors. So this is largely a screening for abnormal development or atypical development, um, and it will cover motor, language, cognitive, and behavioral um, difficulties. Now, I said that this is typically done in these very young children, <laughs> up to three to five years of old, up to the school age. But if you have a child who has significant compromise in his development due to a complex brain uh, injury or brain abnormality, then you might need to have a developmental assessment on your child because your child may not be able to comply with the demands of the psychoeducational assessment or um, a neuropsychological assessment. So the psychoeducational psycho assessment, surprisingly, is the school-aged uh, assessment. It's typically done by uh, school psychologists, although other psychologists may do this. And it really focuses on what are the issues for the child's learning in the classroom. And often, um, or the most common measures that are included here are intellectual ability and academic function. 
And the school psychologist will sometimes also evaluate for the presence of other disorders that may be contributing to school difficulty like um, ADHD or learning disability and so on. And then the neuropsychological assessment covers a broad age range and it includes a comprehensive assessment of multiple domains of functioning. And really what you can do is you can think of these assessments um, by looking at this diagram here where the neuropsychological assessment is the most comprehensive and it in fact would include the kinds of things that are done in the psychoeducational assessment or for the younger child or the more compromised child in the developmental assessment, okay? Now, the other thing that I, sh I should have mentioned, uh, the developmental assessment may be done by a psychologist, but often pediatricians, in particular developmental pediatricians, will do um, developmental assessments. Sometimes occupational therapists will do developmental assessments as well. So there's probably a broader range of professionals who conduct that kind of assessment in comparison to the psychoeducational and the neuropsychological assessment. Now, sometimes our assessments overlap with other professionals because we measure things that fall into the domain of other professionals. So the neuropsychological assessment will include an evaluation of language functions, and a speech-language therapist will evaluate language function. So what we may do is to um, administer some uh, language test and then recommend if we think that the child needs more intensive evaluation or needs some speech language assessment, uh, uh, speech language therapy, refer to a speech language therapist for uh, further assessment of, of language. Also, we tend not to um, assess things like um, articulation or um, dysarthria, those kinds of sort of more uh, motor aspects of speech, and the uh, speech language therapist will do so. Uh, we will uh, typically assess a fine motor abilities, uh, primarily on the hands, and if you want more uh, motor assessment, you could go to a, a physiotherapist, particularly if the child has uh, gross motor um, difficulties. The occupational therapist will also look at motor function and take this into the domain of everyday living and functional implications, so does this child have uh, need um, help learning how to button, learning how to pull up zippers, learning how to use um, cutlery, and so on. And then finally, the um, emotional behavioral piece could overlap with the psychiatric assessment, and we again may refer to a psychiatrist if we think the child needs sort of some um, different type of psychiatric input or perhaps we feel that there are uh, emotional or behavioral issues that uh, might warrant the use of medications. Okay, so we know that epilepsy and seizures have consequences on a whole variety of functions, intelligence, attention, processing speed, memory, problem solving, you name it, you can put it on this list here. Not to say that all children with epilepsy have difficulties, not to say that all children with epilepsy have difficulties in all of these areas, but you will find at least one child, many child, who has difficulties in multiple of these areas. So it's not surprising then that the neuropsychological assessment, particularly of the child with epilepsy, includes those multiple um, functions. So we try to um, include tests of um, abilities that fall in all of those areas. Now, how do we interpret um, scores? So what we do is we give the children the test, and then we tally up how many items they got correct, and we compare that to what other children of the same age are able to complete. And then we use our interpretive guides or our norms um, to uh, see how the child's performance fits on this distribution of scores here. And this is called the normal distribution. Oops, back. This. This is called the normal distribution. 
And what you can see here is that most people in the population fall somewhere here, have average scores, and a smaller percentage are way above average, and a smaller percentage are considerably below average or below age uh, expectations. And this gives us a metric to see if the child is having difficulty, how severe the difficulty is, or is this a strength for the child and how strong it is. And then we can kind of use this um, little metric here, like a stop, uh, set of stop lights, traffic lights. And we can use the colors that you see in this distribution to map on to what we would do when we're approaching an intersection. So if the child's scores are down here in the red zone, we treat that as a stop. Whoa, we have got to do something about this. This child has some extremely low skills, and this child is going to require some very intensive intervention and will need to use some compensatory strategies in these areas. Then we have some children who are below average, but they're not um, in the extremely impaired range, so we kind of look at that as the caution, slow down. This child is below average in these areas and will probably require some support and accommodations to help him come along. If the child is doing very well, is in the green zone, we say age-appropriate skills, don't appear to be any barriers to performance. And for those children who are above average, these are the kids who are likely ahead of their peers in terms of the development of these skills. Now, whether you need to stop or slow down or go ahead depends on the child's age. Because whether or not you fall into the yellow or the red zone, how far behind your age peers is going to be determined by the child's age. So if you have a very young child, say a two-year-old, they may be 10 to 12 months behind and that degree of lag is sufficient to put them in the red range. But at 10 years old, a child who's 10 to 12 months behind would not be in the red range. They would need to be four to six years behind before there's the difference between their performance and that of their peers is significant enough to say, wow, this is a severe problem. Uh, example for the yellow range, at two years of age, a child might be only a few months behind. At 10 years of age, they might be two to three years behind. So those gaps, the interpretation of those gaps, will differ depend on the, and depending on the child's age. Now, I pointed out to you that we um, try to test a lot of different um, abilities in our assessment. And we have different tests to measure uh, different things. And there are lots and lots and lots of psychological tests out there. It's a huge industry, believe me. The testing companies uh, are always trying to come up with something that they claim is better so that we will um, buy it and uh, use it. So I didn't bother listing specific tests here because uh, there are too many and because the choice of tests will depend on the psychologist, it will depend on the child's age, the child's needs, and so on. But it's really important for us as psychologists to remember and for you as parents and uh, individuals to know that no test measures just one thing. We're not that perfect. So for example, if we give the child a spelling test and they do poorly on the spelling test, we might say, this child can't spell. And then the question would be, why can't this child spell? And then we have to drill down and say, well, a spelling test, if we say, you know, Here's a pencil and here's a piece of paper. Write, write these words. Spell cat, spell run, spell work, spell neuropsychology. That requires a whole lot of things. It requires motor coordination to do the writing. It requires language and language understanding. It requires phonological processing, being able to work out the different sounds that the letters make. It requires memory. Do I learn how to spell cat three weeks ago? Do I remember how to spell cat? It requires visual perception because we have to see the letters on the page. And of course, it requires hearing because you have to be able to hear what someone has asked, just asked you to spell. So 
a test can be quite, might seem to be simple at face level, but then you have to drill down and say, what is it about this test that gave this particular child so much difficulty? And that leads to the question of why do we need so many tests? Because if you've ever had one of these assessments, or if a child had one of these assessments, it can go on and on and on. And one reason is because of what I just showed you, because we often need multiple tests to tease these things apart, and because we assess so many functions. And we also want to give, sometimes we want to give multiple tests in the same domain to see whether or not we can um, obtain a reliable pattern of results. So um, there are many different, for example, let's say I was testing your child's memory. Well, I know there are many different kinds of memory. There's short-term memory, there's working memory, there's autobiographical memory, there's semantic memory, there's procedural memory. I'm not going to capture all of those just in one test. So I will often need to use multiple tests in order to get the full um, range of abilities there. Now here's another reason why we like to do comprehensive assessment. I want you to look at this list of problems or disorders, depression, opposition defiant disorder, anxiety disorder, learning disorder, Tourette's syndrome, poor social history, lead poisoning, poor hearing, on and on and on, head injury, neurological disease, et cetera, et cetera. What do they all have in common? Hmm? The brain, right? they are all routinely mistaken for ADHD. So if you want to come at a proper assessment, you have to tease apart this sort of pattern of overlapping um, symptoms and really try to drill down and say, what is it that's really going on here? So as we were just saying, these, this can be time consuming. The child needs to be rested and motivated. Sometimes we, um, it, you know, we're working with young children or we're working with children who don't have much physical stamina or we're working with children who have attention deficit problems. We might need multiple sessions because maybe they can only re maintain their effort or their focus for five minutes, ten minutes. So this can be quite uh, lengthy. And we apologize for that, but there's no way around it. Now, sometimes we need to deviate from the standardized assessment. And I alluded to this earlier when I talked about how we have to test the limits. And we have to do this because when we're working with special populations, particularly children with neurological populations, particularly children who have had large cortical resections, they may have a lot of difficulties that make standardized assessment challenging. So for example, if we have a test that requires verbal responses, I say, what is the capital of France? You need to be able to speak to answer that question. And that's going to be difficult for the child who has language problems or oral motor difficulties. Um, you need to be able to understand that question, and that might be challenging for the child with a hearing impairment or whose first language is not um, English. Um, if we don't have uh, tests in their native language. The test may require motor responses. We might want the child point, point to the picture that shows this, tap this key as fast as you can, reach for this, and that's going to be a problem for the child who has motor um, difficulties. And a lot of our um, tests involve looking at stimuli, looking at pictures, looking at objects, manipulating objects, and that's going to be challenging for um, the child who has visual impairment. So if they have low vision or they have a, a large visual field defect, then we have to be careful about that as well. But a good neuropsychologist will be aware of that, and there are different approaches that we can use. So first of all, there are tests that are designed specifically for use uh, for children with these kinds of difficulties, so we can choose to use those kinds of tasks. We may adapt testing to yield qualitative results. So we can say, you know, I can't use, the, I can't give you an interpretation based on the standardized assessment, but here's what I can tell you that we observe that your child can do, and that suggests to us X, Y, and Z, and that suggests to us that these might be the kinds of adaptations that would also be useful to the child at home or in school. And we can also refer to specialists. There are psychologists who are specialized in uh, uh, working with individuals with low vision. There are psychologists who 
are specialized in working with individuals with hearing disorders and so on. So what do we do with all this information? We want to use it to describe problems in relation to underlying neurological dysfunction in comparison to same age peers, and also to look at the child's own strengths and weaknesses. So we might say this child is 10 years old, is not functioning at a 10-year-old level in any area, but let's drill down and see at his own level where are his strengths and where are his weaknesses. And this will help to explain the challenges that children face at home and at school. So we base these conclusions on the test scores, the patterns of test scores. We base them on diagnostic criteria for these that exist for these particular um, disorders. And we hope that the results end up being useful for parents and children, being useful for the medical team, and being useful for the school. And I have to say that, um, you know, in my experience, so many times parents have said, you know, I never realized that epilepsy could do this. I never realized that this um, could be a consequence of my child's epilepsy. And now all of a sudden, tick, 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 things are falling into boxes and I understand. Um, and you think like, well, how did you get to this level without realizing that? Like where, why was there this lack of information that was never transmitted to you about the impact of epilepsy? on these very important aspects of the child's development. Um, we've seen terrible misattributions from school because we know that children with epilepsy are quite variable in their responses. Maybe if you, I, I call it the good day, bad day uh, phenomenon. And the school will often say, oh, you know, Johnny's having a bad day. He's just not trying. He's just not motivated and doesn't understand that there's all kinds of underlying brain gunk going on here that helps explain that. Um, and that you don't treat them, you don't punish them for having a bad day because they are trying, they're probably trying twice as hard as they do when they're having a good day. Now I want to just mention that um, assessment results um, can change over time and this is because development changes over time. So sometimes children show periods of lag, and then they might show a spurt, or then initially they might um, sort of be ahead of themselves, and then they level off. There's all kinds of different trajectories that can um, play out. Um, it might also be that uh, you know early in development, the children seem the child seems to be on track, and then as the uh, uh, brain development is altered these more sophisticated skills don't come online in the way that the earlier, more simple skills um, did. And so you might see, if your child has multiple assessments, you might see a different pattern of scores or different score results over time. And I want to remind you that the way that we use the norms is that they always compare the child's performance to that expected of his age. So if the child is not developing at the same rate as his peers, that um, trajectory is going to widen, that, or the, the trajectory will mean that the gap may widen. But that does not mean that your child is not developing skills. It just means they're not developing at the same rate as other kids. So I'll give you some, an example here. So this is a hypothetical graph that I made up. I pretended that I tested a child at age 6, 9, 12, and 15 on this particular task. It's called coding, where they have to um, learn and transcribe symbols that go with numbers. And when I saw this child at age 6, she got an average score. I retested her at age 9. Her score was lower. Now it's falling in the low average range. At age 12, oh my gosh, now she's in the impaired range. And at age 15, it's even worse. So if you didn't know any better, you might say, oh, this child is deteriorating in this ability. She's losing skills. This is terrible. But in fact, this is what's really happened. If we look at the raw scores, the number that the child got correct, at each age, it's exactly the same. So this child isn't losing skills. This child is not gaining in this area. But that has very different implications. 
And so that's something that if you, know, if you go for multiple assessments and there is a change, you need to sit down with the psychologist and say, is this a loss? Is this a plateau? Is this a slower rate of development? And all of these are shown here. So if we look at this line here, and pretend this is typical development, you might see that the child shows a delay, but they're con that child's continuing to, de to develop over time. Every year, they're doing more, but what's happening is that the gap is widening, so the score might look, oh, might look worse. This purple line here shows a child who's basically stagnated or plateaued in development. And this is what a regression would look like. But all of these would result in lower um, test scores at age four than at age two, even though the pattern of development is very different. So how do you find a neuropsychologist besides uh, coming to a conference like this? You um, often these assessments are done in the context of specialized medical service in a hospital. Um, schools or pediatricians may have a list of providers. The American Board of Professional Psychology has a directory of neuropsychologists that I think you can access online. And you could go to your state psychology board or psychological association, and they have a list of psychological um, providers. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Yes. Right, so first of all, um, there's no reason why a child with epilepsy cannot have ADHD or some other um, diagnosis. It just needs a careful evaluation. And I think it's actually very, very important for the child's best functioning to, um, to know whether or not they have those diagnoses. So for example, we know that ADHD is about five or six more times common in children with epilepsy than it is in the general population. And it can have quite a devastating impact on your cognitive development, your behavior, and your outcomes. And it's very important to um, recognize it. So um, it's not impossible. It can be challenging. And that's why you need a good pediatric neuropsychologist. And a pediatric neuropsychologist would be able to do that kind of um, parcellation or ascertainment much uh, more reliably than, than, say, a school psychologist who's not trained in, in, the, in the brain and the particular disorders. Yes. Um, my son had um, a temperature climb every two months, and lots of the doctors say you know it's a rebirth. Um, and so we're, we have a really good medical team. But when would you say would be an appropriate time to have an evaluation, like really give them a fair chance to heal and kind of catch up and do a fair assessment? Yeah. So I. Um, so the, it depends, right? So if your child needs some re rehab after the surgery, then they might need an assessment to guide that rehab. So let's say your child um, had speech and language difficulties and you want the speech and language therapy. So they're going to need a language evaluation to know what skills to target and what level to target them at. Um, if the assessment is not used for that reason, I think that there are certain key points in the child's developmental trajectory where it's, it could be quite valuable to have assessments. One would be before the child goes to school. So where I live, children start school at age four, and I think to have an assessment before they go to school is important because um, um, that can alert the school to what supports they might need, very important in those early ages to begin to build the foundations for the academic skills. I also think that about age six is a great age to have an assessment because that's when reading typically comes online. Children start to learn to read, and we know how important reading is for academic performance. So um, if they don't have the foundation skills uh, for reading readiness, it's important to recognize that early. I think the trans transition from sort of elementary school to junior school is an important time because as the child progresses in school, 
the supports the school provide or the learning expectations change. So as the child gets older, there's less structure, less support, more learning on your own. So some children I find can do well up to the sixth and seventh grade, and then everything falls apart because all of a sudden the expectations are different. And now Johnny's expected to do a project on his own and he does not have a clue on how to do it. And then maybe transition to high school or beyond. But it's going to depend very much as well on the child, uh, their individual developmental level and needs. So uh, this one, yes. Absolutely, yeah. So those are key times without uh, a, a trigger a change, but if there's something else, then absolutely. Yes? Yeah, that depends on jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So most surgical centers uh, will, the uh, neurologist or the neurosurgeon, will uh, make the referral um, a, 10, 12 years after. You could ask your um, family doctor, your pediatrician. You could talk to the school about the whether or not they think there's a need for an assessment and who they might do, whether or not they might recommend. If you, um, and, and different places, like I'll accept a parent referral if it's a child through who's been through my uh, program. Um, psychologists in private practice will accept parent referrals. So it depends very much on where the psychologist is working, what the um, option is. Some, some will require a doctor to make a referral, but others will not. Oh, ooh, I'd like to see that too. Yeah, so I don't know any systematic research, but that's certainly something that we will do in our evaluation. We might say, you know, this child is significantly below the level for his age, and in fact, his vocabulary is at a three-year-old level or a four-year-old level. And, you know, so we will do that in our assessment as well, is to give you that um, age-related information, because that's important then to help people um, provide the, uh, to help people form the proper expectations of what the child um, can do, and, um, and also a, a basis for, you know, where do we start to remediate? If we assume the child is functioning up here, that's going to overshoot the mark. We need to know the child is functioning down here and can start there. Yeah. Yes? You had mentioned the target of speech and mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So so often we'll say, okay, the child has X, you know, has difficulties where it, for attention. Or, or we might say this child requires an IEP, number one. These are the areas that should be addressed in the IEP. Here are some kinds of um, modifications that may help this child, but to actually f formulate the IEP, that's done at the school level um, in consultation with, they take the information from the neuropsych assessment and um, in consultation with a special education teacher. Well, I meant something like, I might say, this child needs speech and language pathology, focusing on X, Y, and Z. This child needs an IEP. This child should go for an evaluation of whether or not they might benefit from for treatment of the ADHD. And in the meantime, 
here's some modifications that can be made in the classroom to help um, monitor or, or help try to contain the attentional problems. Recommendations are part of it. You know, the only time I don't write recommendations is that rare time when I say, this child's doing well in school, the neuropsych assessment did not reveal any difficulties, no recommendations are needed. Mm, I write one of those about once every 10 years. <laughs> yes? I, you know, it, it's age dependent and it's therapy dependent. I like to wait actually. Uh, so when children have hemispherectomies, they're often then sent for rehab. And in the context of rehab, they'll have assessments about, you know, what their motor skills are like. And so they, you know, we know where to start, the, what to do with the physiotherapy. Or they'll do a speech language assessment so that they know where to start with the speech language. I like to have the neuropsych assessment one year. And I figure that's enough time for the brain to have done its initial healing from the surgery. And if there's changes in the child, there's enough time for those changes to be declared, whether they're improvements or whether there has been loss of function. So, um, and we know that in that first year, there's a lot of recovery that goes on. So if we do an assessment at six weeks, it's not going to be the same child again at six months. That doesn't mean some children don't need some form of um, briefer intervention at six, week, six weeks to guide whatever um, acute intervention they might get. Yes? Yeah, it's um, so obviously um, there's some advantage to that because the child that person knows what your child was like at the previous assessment. Um, if it's not possible, then um, please do share the report and the results with the second person because it's so valuable to us to have some kind of baseline or prior um, assessment results to um, understand the child's trajectory. Like some people will say to me, I don't want to give you that because I don't want you to be biased. And I'd say like, well, I'm a professional. I'm not going to be biased, but this is really going to help me understand where your child's coming from and at what rate they are developing and so on. Yeah, final question, I guess. Quick question about the uh, graphic played up there about mm -hmm. the percent uh, lateralists. Mm -hmm. um, I realize that these kiddos are uh, either vastly premature or critical. But the child is in the single digit or even percentiles, and there are some other areas where you're seeing kids with some symptoms. Can you talk a little bit about where the focus should go? Should we bring up those lower scores into the 20s? Yeah, so for those scores that are in the 50s that are developing uh, normally, they're doing that on their own. So they're not the things that need, need intervention, but they can be used as props or scaffolds for the weak ones. So for example, um, some children have strong visual skills, but poor language skills. So we might say, why not use a lot of visual aids in the child's learning in the classroom. So supplement with pictures, sub, like get the child to do hands-on projects rather than reading books when, when reading is a disaster and so on. So we, you, the best thing is to try to use the strengths to bolster the areas of weakness. The strengths will probably continue on their own. They're not, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't invest my money in strengthening the strengths. <laughs>